hello, hello. Uh oh, network error. Oh, there we go. We're up and running. Cool. I can hear, yes. Does every, everybody see me and hear me? I hope. I hope. Yes, no. I think so. Possibly. Yes. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, it is a little strange that Twitch is only showing me one person in the room, which would be me, but I can see you guys are chatting in the chat window, so whatever, as long as, uh, as, long as you're here, that's what's important. Um, before I start this demo, <laughs> before I start this demo, um, I would really like to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, some people were having some difficulties with, with things. Um, so I want to open it up first to sort of a Q&A thing or uh, can I troubleshoot your any issues you might have right now? Like, let's start that way. So who's got, who's got problems? With Maya, I mean, <laughs> specifically. Who's got some issues with Maya? Anybody have any issues with Maya besides it not installing? That's a, definitely a problem. Uh, any other issues with Maya? Or any questions in regards? This is what we did last class. Um, do I need to go over this again with you guys? Because the first class basically said, yeah, yeah, we, we want you to do the whole candle all over again, which I'm willing to do. I just need to know from you if that's, that's what you would like me to do. Um, how do I make a shape slanted? Okay, so the answer is yeah, you guys want me to to repeat the demo. That's fine. Um, sure, no problem. I did that for the first class. Also, I should mention that this is being recorded on Twitch, so you can always go back to the recordings. There's going to be a lot of repetition because I have two classes in a row that are completely the same. So there'll actually be two two Twitch recordings, which should be pretty pretty much the same material. So, hey, I mean, now you can watch the Twitch recordings on your own time, and there'll even be two, which <laughs> basically the same. All right, uh, first, I want to start with hiding my old demo. The way I'll do this is I'll go to my outliner. The outliner is at the bottom of my toolbar. That's here. So this last icon down here, bottom of toolbar, that's my outliner. And then I'll shift select all of the work, and I'll hit Control H. Control H is hide. Control Shift H is unhide. So first shortcut of the day, Control H hide, Control Shift H unhide. Control H hide. So that way, you know, easy way just to, to hide the old stuff and start with a new one. Teach us how to pinch edge loops. Yes, yes. How to delete, uh, yep, yep, got it. Okay, we're doing it again from scratch. So first pick like the camera that you want to load the image into. So like the side camera maybe, or even go to quad view. That might be even a little bit easier. And we have the side camera down here. It says clearly side versus front versus top versus perspective. Obviously, this is the perspective here. This is the quad view. We want to either use front or side. Either one should work. We'll go to view, we'll go to image plane, and we'll click import image. From here, simply load in your photo reference, like that. And then we can tap the space bar to maximize our view. We can scale the image plane. Like that. Then I personally like to have the Y axis, which is to say this black line here, go basically through the middle of my reference. You don't absolutely have to do it this way, but uh, I like to do it this way just for symmetry. And um, I guess I'm used to dealing with symmetry both in ZBrush and in Maya. Um, so that's just a personal preference. When you create your cylinder, so I'll create my cylinder. There it is, cylinder. You'll notice that the image plane by default goes through the object. I personally find that super freaking annoying. So what I do is I select my image plane, hit W for move, and then push it back, just so it doesn't go right through my object. Um, check your side view, make sure that you can see both the object and the image plane. 
And if you can, then you're good to go. If for some reason you can't, then probably your image plane is probably in front of your object. So just keep that in mind. Push the image plane behind your object. Tap the spacebar. Now let's start. Um, we need to have some subdivisions, not very many, but some. So under inputs, change your subdivision height to, I don't know, 8 or 10. Keep the number relatively low because we want to, again, work from simple to complex. So we'll say 8 or 10 or, you know what, let's keep it really simple. Let's say 6. And again, this is like an arbitrary number, meaning that, you know, um, maybe you think you need 10, 10 edge loops. Um, that's fine. Then go ahead and start with 10. It's up to you. But remember that the less edge loops that you start with, typically, the easier your job will be. I, I, I repeat, typically. So if I were to start off with like 20 or 30 edge loops, then I would spend a lot of time adjusting 30 edge loops and deleting some of them. And yeah, it's, just, it's just maybe too much. So I typically try to start with few subdivisions. For caps, though, caps should basically always be at, at least two. And the caps, of course, are the top and bottom of the cylinder, right? So you could go with more if you wanted to, but general wisdom is that you should have at least two for your caps. And again, that's, that's the edge loops around here. Speaking of edge loops, I want you guys to uh, learn a new shortcut because you know I am the shortcut Nazi. I mean... I am the shortcut uh, uh, maniac, or or the shortcut uh, uh, fiend, or the shortcut uh, crazy per I love my shortcuts. So, <laughs> F10, right? Um, make sure that your F keys are enabled. F10 will take you to your edge mode. To, to select the entire loop, you double click. So we'll go to the side view. Just tap your space bar. We'll double click the edge loop. R for scale, use the center box. Scale in words until you start to see your reference. Now, if you feel like, well, I'm not able to see my reference at all because the geometry is blocking it, I guess we can all say, duh, you're right. <laughs> That's true. And it is a problem. So if it bothers you, and it might, it's understandable, you can always hit the four key. And the four key will show you your wireframe everything becomes transparent and you can double click again double click your edge loop and again scale in for me that's a little hard to see it's actually too transparent I mean it's really hard to see what's going on so four wireframe five shaded you can already see immediately I need more edge loops I'll move this up here I'll go to my next edge, edge loop, move this down. Now, the new shortcut I want to teach you guys, which I think is super useful personally, is if you have an edge loop selected, like say I have this guy selected, and I want to move to the next edge loop, I can actually just use my arrow key. Specifically, my left arrow key goes up, my right arrow key goes down. That's just a really quick way to select your edge loops. Anyway, I think it's useful. And I want to add to that that loops are this, this goes this way, horizontal, but I could also select a row of, of edges by selecting the up arrow key, and you can see now I have a row of edges selected, and if you guessed, yeah, uh, moving the edge rows would be your up and down arrow key, then, then you're, you're, uh, you guessed correctly, logically, yes. Up and down moves your edge rows, and then left and right moves your edge loops and I'm a little uh, arrow key crazy just like I'm shortcut crazy so if I have a vertice selected then I can actually use my arrow keys to move around my vertex selection as well this is called pick walking and it's really useful if you happen to lose a vertice somehow and like the vertice is hidden I don't know it's pretty useful okay back to modeling so, and by the way, guys, please interrupt me or stop me at any time. And I prefer if you say something out loud, just because I can't look at the chat window simultaneously. 
But, um, you know, I'll answer your questions in chat too. I just kind of prefer you to speak up if you can. It, this is still relatively new to me. Doing everything with Twitch and Discord is like, uh, I just want to hear human voices. Um, why repeats the tool? In this case, repeats the edge loop tool. R, again, scale. Make sure that you've double clicked the edge loop. Scale in. And move it maybe up or down. Scale again. Why to repeat the tool? Slide it to where you want it. Scale in. See, now I'm getting this shape here. Um, why to repeat the tool? Slide one down. Pinch your edge loops together. Because if you pinch your edge loops together, it's going to retain that shape. Specifically, it's going to retain your detail. So watch what happens. If I say Y and then pinch my edge loop, now, and, and really pinch them close together, the closer you pinch your edge loops together, the sharper this will be. Now when I hit the 3 button, you can really see that effect. And it's okay, by the way, to model with the 3 button. There's like That's totally allowed. But I would say that if you're going to model with the 3 button on, um, you should have a relatively fast computer. And um, it is a little dangerous, so I personally prefer to model with uh, the one button on. And then when I'm ready to check my pro progress, like I'll slide these edge loops together, right? Three edge loops, by the way, is a good number. Then I'll hit three, and I can see that I've tightened that up by using additional edge loops. I'll do it again. Why to repeat the tool? Ah. Squeeze the edge loops together. Check it by hitting the three button. Q, F8. See how that works? So I'll do it over here. And by the way, you can hit the two button if you're comfortable with that. Well, personally, I really like the one button for modeling, but you know, whatever floats your boat. I'm just saying that for me personally, I'll model in base mesh mode with one. Why to repeat the tool? Slide my edge loop out or down rather. Um, uh, make another edge loop here. This one I'm going to scale. Why to repeat the tool? Make another one here maybe. R for scale. And like once I have something, I've done a little bit of work. I'll hit the three button. And you know, again, I can model this way. It's fine. It's just a question of um, how fast your computer is and if you feel comfortable doing it. So if you feel comfortable modeling in three mode, there's no reason you can't. It's not like it's forbidden. I just, for stability reasons, I repeat for stability, meaning that Maya will crash if you model enough stuff in three mode all the time. So I just kind of avoid that problem model with one or two mode and then check my modeling by hitting the three button. Q, F8, bam. Questions? Anybody? Uh, if you have a question it's better to ask on Discord audio because I have to like demonstrate and then I have to look at the chat. Demonstrate, look at chat. Demonstrate, look at... Just, just speak up. Say something. You're... You know, your, um, you know, your voice is something I appreciate. Your Discord audio doesn't work. Okay, well, I mean, <laughs> if you can speak up, I'd appreciate it. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, deleting edge loops. I'll get to that in one second. If, is it okay if our candle does not look exactly like our reference because... I like what I have over the reference image. Uh, I mean, the answer to that question is please try to always match your photo reference, but for your very first assignment, I'm not going to be like overly harsh. I would just appreciate it 
If going forward, you always try to match your photo reference as much as possible. This is your first assignment, and I realize that. So I'm not going to be like... I'm not going to cry if it doesn't match your photo reference for your very first assignment. I'm just going to say, please going forward, do not make me a sad panda. Match your photo reference as closely as possible. Um, do I recommend using x-ray mode to model from reference? It's optional. Um, does it require a fast computer? No. Um, here, I'm going to go back and actually turn x-ray mode back on. Because, yeah, it can definitely be useful. Some people really love it. I like it definitely more. I like I like X-ray more than I like. Hey, I don't know if you oh, can hear me. I do. But, I can. Yes. Uh, yes. Um. How would you make a cylinder uh, slanted? Slanted. Um. Hold on. Cylinder slanted. You, you mean like rotating the edge loop, perhaps? And then uh, moving it out definitely gives me a slant. I don't know if that's what you mean. You mean like the whole object slanted? I mean, again, when you say slant, that implies rotation, right? So you can rotate a bunch of edge loops if you wanted to. Like, I don't know, all these uh, edge loops. Is that not what you mean, slanted? It's, it's more like... Um it, it's more like uh, the one cylinder that this is so jarring hearing my voice on the stream as well. Um, <laughs> it's it's um, uh, I don't know how to explain it. One cylinder, but the very top needs to be slanted. Yeah, halfway. Slanted, I, but I mean like it's rotation, I, right? I'm so not sure. I'll send a picture of like my candle. Okay. And general chat sure show you how yeah it's like slanted okay yeah yeah absolutely I mean I'm here to answer your questions most of all so like if you can follow me along with the demo that's great but uh, it's more important that I solve your issues by answering your questions like that's actually maybe the most important thing so yeah of course please please Give me your questions. Give me your questions. I want to know what your questions are. Use the left and right arrow keys, like I keep saying, to go through your loops. So you notice if I use my left button, left arrow key goes down through my loops, up arrow key goes up through my loops, and so on. So arrow keys are pretty awesome. Get used to using them. And then, like, the three button, right? So I go one... Go back to my base mesh, scale a little bit. Why to repeat the tool? Add a new edge loop. Double click to get the edge loop. R for scale. Scale it out. Hit the three button. Bam. F8 for object mode. Click off of it. Compare. Does this look like this? Eh, it's getting there. Pretty close, right? So that's basically your workflow. Um, select your edge loop, double click it, then scale with the gold box in the center. Compare the shape. It looks like I have like another kind of ridge or an another undulation. So um, what do we do? If you guessed add insert edge loop, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, pretty much. Rinse, wash, repeat, do it again. Why to repeat the tool? Just pinch your edge loops together. Hit the three button. Q for select. F8 for object mode. Maybe we want this to be kind of pinched together. This looks like it should be higher. So then hit the one button. Select your edge loop. And this is F10, remember, not F11. Move it up, like that. Use your left or right arrow key to go to the next edge loop. Then move this one up, like so. See? Then hit the three button. And if you need to continue to add edge loops, hit Y to repeat the tool, hit one. 
and then kind of like figure out, okay, I need more edge loops. R to scale. Y. The tighter that you, or the closer you pinch your edge loops together, um, the more that detail will be preserved when you hit the three key. So if you really, really pinch your, your edge loops together really tightly, then you're going to see the tighter you pinch them together, the more you've kind of uh, made a really tight um, seam or preserve the detail, basically. right? So then you start to get tighter ridges. So like if I wanted this to be like uh, really, really sharp, like say for example, hmm, like right here, I want this to be super, super sharp here. Like I want this line to basically be, vis be visible in the mesh. So I'll, I'll click one, I'll click Y again to repeat my tool. And this, this edge loop, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really just, just basically slam it against the edge loop underneath it. And I mean like really. Don't overlap your edge loops though, which is a weird thing. I know it's kind of strange. Then hit three. Let's zoom in a little closer. If you still aren't getting the effect you want, so like see I'm not getting this really nice line here or this really nice seam, here's how you fix it. Take your edge loops and put them almost right on top of each other hit F for fit. See how close these edge loops are together? And then make a third edge loop. This is kind of an interesting thing. Three edge loops is usually the magic number if you want a really tight, see? One to make the shape, and then the second and third edge loop specifically to slam against the middle edge loop. And if you have all three edge loops basically slammed against each other, like really tight, really close, really close together. Then we hit the three button, and there it is. Now, now that looks like what I want. Now I've got that really nice detail. So pre to preserve the detail, either make additional edge loops or slam three edge loops together, like tighten them together. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop and check. Pinching edge loops, wait, wait, wait. Is it okay if our candle doesn't look exactly like our reference? Yeah, yeah, like I said, <sighs> try to, um, please try to match your photo reference always, but it's your first assignment, and I understand that, so just do your best. Um, next question, pinching edge loops, I just went over that. Okay, but how do you make half a cylinder slanted? Okay, I'm going to answer that right now. Do you recommend using x-ray mode? I just went over that. Um, yes, please use Discord audio if possible. So let's talk about this whole slanting thing, a sl slanted cylinder. Let's look in the... Discord chat, maybe I can see a picture of what you mean. Oh, you mean like, oh, I see what you're talking about. The candles themselves, want, you want the candles to be slanted? Yes? E, yeah, E for rotate, rotate the top. And yeah, that's one way to do it. But I wanna teach you guys a little bit of new material, so please, please, please pay attention. A little bit of new material. Because let's say we wanna make a candle like the one in the image there that's been posted, right? So we wanna, we wanna make um, a different type of candle. It's been melted a little bit, right? So let's do that. Of course, start with your cylinder. There is an interactive creation thing, by the way. So under create polygon primitive, you can either turn on intera interactive creation or not. It's totally your call, whatever you're more comfortable with. I'm pretty old school. Yeah, I've been modeling in Maya since version two. I don't even want to know what year that was, but probably 96 or 97. Yeah. Anyway, I've been using Maya a long time. So we didn't used to have interactive creation. This is relatively new. The difference is if I make a, po a polygon primitive right now, like a sphere or whatever, it's just going to pop into place. Right? But if I have interactive creation on, so I go again to create polygon primitive and I turn on interactive creation, then now when I create something, it's going to allow me to create first the base and then the height, which is something they stole from 3D Studio Max. I mean, they didn't steal, it was that Autodesk bought Maya. 
so they didn't have to steal it. It was under the same company. All right, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. How much density do we want for this candle? Let's give it a little bit, like, I don't know, six. And of course, we always want caps at two. I think that's probably enough for what I want to do here. Uh, we'll make this a little bit more interesting, close to the reference that's in the Discord right now. And yeah, 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 I know I should load it up as an image plane. And yeah, 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 you should use image planes and blah, blah. I'm just going to do it from memory. I know it's kind of a no-no, but oh well, I'm going to do it. So if I were to select this edge loop and rotate it, then yeah, I could get the tilt that I'm looking for, right? But I'm going to do you one better than that. I'm going to use a new technique called soft select. Somebody did this by accident, I think. So let's do it on purpose. Here's how it works. We select everything that we want to rotate. So I'll select all the top vertices by going into F9 for vertex mode, selecting all the top vertices. And yes, I can rotate them like this, and that's fine. But what I want to teach you is soft select. So hit the B button. The B button turns soft select on and off. If you hold down the B button and drag, then you have this fall off. And this fall off is going to allow you to now do what? It's going to allow you to rotate all of it like that with a fall off. So it's optional. You don't have to use soft select. But by using soft select, you can see the results. right? So how can we use soft select to kind of make um, this thing? I'll select the middle vertice. I'll hold down B to change my fall off. And then I'll just simply move the middle down like that. And again, you don't have to have soft select on. You can definitely turn it off. Hit the B button to turn it off. This is one of those things where um, you develop these modeling skill sets given enough time. So don't worry if this confuses you in the beginning. It's just like anything else in life. You know, you'll get better at it the more you do it. So we add an additional edge loop. Maybe here. And maybe here. Oops. In this case, ah, no, in this case here, there we go. Now we're starting to get that indention. We hit the three button to check. So now I've got that indention for the candle, but I want it to be um, rotated. And again, it's optional to use soft select. If you feel like it makes the most sense to use soft, soft select, then by all means do that. So maybe I want to, um, here's how we're going to make this melty, right? Here's how soft select will really come in handy for you. Check this out. If I select a few vertices, this is where the heat, for whatever reason, is most powerful. I hit B for soft select, and I hold down B and drag. That increases my fall off. I hit W for move, and then I'm melting my candle. Oh my god, it's melting. Before we had sculpting, available to us in like ZBrush and Mudbox, we had soft select. And man, soft select is pretty powerful, even now. Does this answer your question? I hope. Maybe? I don't know. Nobody's saying anything, so. I'm just going to teach in silence. <laughs> A little frustrating. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, cool. That's what I like to hear. Soft select is really powerful, as you can see. There's your melty candle. All right. Don't forget about your snapping. W for move. And when I say snapping, I mean um, hold down the V button, drag the circle snaps right to it. So if you have an object way over here, which might happen, then V for vertex snapping. Make sure to drag the circle and see it just pops right to where I want it. F for fit. I want to snap it to the center of this guy. V for vertex snapping. Snap to the center. Oh, there it is. 
and then move it up. Yeah, that's a lot more interesting. Oops, a little too much scaling going on there. Let's just scale a little bit. That's probably good. Okay, there we are. Now, um, generally speaking, we don't want our objects to like uh, pass through each other. Uh, that's kind of a, it's kind of a, a rule, I guess you could say. Um, all rules get broken sometimes, often, but we would like instead the candle to kind of set be set inside. So back to our soft select, select the inner vertice, hold down B and drag. Pull this down. You know, let's let's actually hold down B and drag farther. Pull this down. Unhide this. You can either turn the visibility on or off. It's a binary switch. Zero is off, one is on. Or if you want to be like a cool kid, you can hit H for hide, or excuse me. Yeah, H for hide and shift H for unhide. Because you know. All the cool kids use shortcuts. I mean, keep their jobs. <laughs> Sorry. Bad joke. But not really. It's true. Like, if you want to keep your job, know your shortcuts. Really. Be efficient. The more efficient you are, the more likely you get to keep your job. Okay. Um, should we do the wick? What do you guys think? Okay, yeah, yeah. What I, t tell me what to do next. The wick, yes? Okay, I guess the wick. Okay. All right, so the wick is basically a cylinder again. That's fine. Make another one. Scale it. Change your heights to something small, six. Change your caps to two. Um, and now we're gonna snap it by holding down V for vertex snapping. Snap it to where your candle is, hit F for fit. We want it in the center of the candle. We want it on that guy. So again, V for vertex snapping, drag the circle. Come on, come on, there it is. Scale. 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 That's the universal scale, by the way. That's the vertical scale. Cool. And now since we just learned our soft select, F for fit, we just learned our soft select, let's use it again. Because it's super cool. F9, select the vertices. Now maybe rotate. Oh, now what's the problem there? The problem there is my fall off is too great. So hold down B and drag, B, drag, B. Oh, there it is, there's the big circle. So when you see the big circle, that's gonna control your fall off. Then go ahead and use that. A little rotation. Uh, we want it to taper perhaps, so hit R for scale, and then taper using soft select. And then I made a wick. It's pretty similar, close enough. Yeah, not too hard. Oh, hit the three button on everything, all the time, no matter what. Write that down. Please. Always. Always and forever. The three button. Use it. So right now, when I'm modeling, I'm going to stay in one, in the uh, one uh, base mesh view. Because it's just simply easier for me to do that. And also, it's less stress on Maya. So less stress on Maya means less stress on you. So I suggest, you know, modeling in the one mode. That's not to say that you can't model in two or three. We're gonna model in two here in a minute. But I usually model in one and then check it by hitting three. And like I hit the three button and I can see this freaking candle is floating. So rules, rules for modeling. Um, no floating objects, please. Floating objects are actually worse than objects that pass through one another. Because, like, see, I can actually push the candle down into the candlestick holder a little bit, and that looks better than it floating. I don't want any, I don't want to see any floating candles. I don't want to see any floating objects. Please, no floating objects. That is a rule. Write it down. No floating objects. 
Okay. I think my candle's done. Next, name everything. I mean, I could actually, I could spend more time doing this because you can see the base is definitely not right. So, um, man. So I could um, double click this edge loop, for example, scale gold box inwards. Hit the three button. And like I said, if you want to model this way, you can. It definitely will work. Um, I would just say, oh, yeah. I would just say it's a little bit riskier to do it this way. If you feel like I have an i7 and with an NVIDIA GPU, I'm not afraid of the three button, then by all means, go ahead. I personally prefer to model in one. It's less risky, less chance of, uh, less chance of crashing. Um, just, it's, just, it's just safer for me. And then I hit the three button. Um, and if you still can't tell what's going on, hit F8 and click off the object. So, like, this shape is not quite what I want, is it? So, if you really want to keep the smooth on, because it's a little bit confusing otherwise, then you can. I'm just warning you guys that it can, I repeat, potentially make things a little scary. And it can potentially make Maya crash. And uh, it's a little risky, honestly. And it's also hard to select edge loops, like, what the crap? I don't know why it is, but that's just, yeah. It's a little harder to select my edge loops, to, or at least to me, I think it is um, a little more difficult. But I'm not going to say you can't model. You can model in one, two, or three. It's like kind of whatever you feel comfortable with. I feel more comfortable with one and then checking in three. But you can just see I just modeled that in three, and that's fine too. As long as, you're, as, long as your software doesn't crash, I guess. Do whatever floats your boat, whatever makes you happy. Um, all right, um, I'm going to call this done, even though I could definitely add more edge loops and I could definitely keep going. But just for time's sake, let's just call this basically done. Now name everything in your outliner. So over here, this is going to be the candle holder. This is going to be the candle. This is going to be the wick. Okay, well, how can we make that even more efficient? We can shift select all three, and we can group them together by hitting control G for grouping. That now kind of puts it all into one group, and I can name the group just simply candle. And then that way, I have my three sub objects, kind of my wick, my candle, and my candle holder are all in the candle group. And then this is also very useful because now, when I move it, it's going to move everything at once. So I'm moving the entire group. And also when I scale it, it's going to scale everything together. So pretty important to get in the habit of grouping stuff together. That way you can treat the group as one object. Maybe I want to rotate the whole damn thing. Sure, there you go. No problem. It's in a group. Everybody with me? I've been modeling with three. You can model with three, that's fine. I won't stop you. I'm just going to warn you that it might be dangerous. That's all. The Discord audio delay hurts me. I'm sorry. Um, I have my audio on OBS and not Discord. Um, I can switch to Discord audio, but that's worse. I tried that with the first class, and they immediately said, please go back to the other one. I'm turning off the phone. Sorry. Okay. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. Are you guys ready to make the table? Maybe? Possibly? Hopefully? Guys, if nobody's going to say anything, I'm just going to go ahead and continue with the table. So, any problems before I continue with the table at all? Um, when you say monolith... Go ahead. When, I, 
Say again. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just didn't. Can say it again. I I can hear you. I just didn't catch what you said. That's all. I'm turning up my volume. So what was the question? Sorry. Whoever said that, can they repeat the question? Well, just interrupt me at any time. <laughs> Feel free, really. There's a big Discord audio delay, so it takes some time for you to hear whatever is being said. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a few seconds, that's true. But again, I was using Discord audio for my audio. Um, well, when you hear this, there's a uh, like minute delay in when I speak and when it shows you hearing it. Yeah, that's true, but th that's not terrible. I mean, it's bad, but we can still work with it. Um, and I can understand you and hear you fine. So just go ahead and interrupt me or ask a question. It might be a minute delay, but still, I'd rather I'd rather hear the question um, versus having to check the chat window. But I will do my best to answer questions both via audio as well as via chat. Um, so either one works. I personally prefer audio, so I don't mind being interrupted at any time. Please speak up. I would prefer for you to speak up. But um, I will also do my best to answer questions through the chat also. Okay? All right. So I'm making a table. This is box modeling. Why do we call it box modeling? Well, because it starts, it's a box. We start with a box. That's not that hard. That's why it's box modeling. I know it sounds stupid, but probably 20 years of 3D modeling was all done through box modeling or something. It's like people love it. Um, look, if your table is mostly boxy, then yeah, I mean, hey, let's not. Why not start with a box? It makes sense. What what does the object mostly look like? If your table mostly looks like a box, then then by God, start with a box. Um, now, what makes me crazy and one of my big pet peeves is when people are like, I want to model a human head, and they start with a box. That makes me want to scream, personally. <laughs> so again, think about what the object looks like mostly. If the object mostly looks like a sphere, then start with a sphere. Like this candle looks mostly like a cylinder, start with a cylinder. I know it seems like common sense, but but yeah. So here we go. Um, I want to make this table, and if I hit the three button right now, oh, that's that's not uh, a. Are we supposed to be finding a reference for the table? Good question. Or is this just like a freeform table? In this case, it's freeform. But for most things, I want photo reference. And thank you for speaking up, but really, like, this, in this particular instance, I want you guys to have some creative freedom and, and just kind of do whatever you want with the table, um, because sometimes it's fun to model out of your head. <laughs> How about that? So, add an edge loop. Generally speaking, I always want you to model from photos. But, you know, rules are made to be broken, so let's break a rule. I've added two edge loops. I hit the three button. Look what that does. See, the three edge loops basically retain that detail. Without the edge loops, we get this. Not so great. So, now I'm in two mode, by the way. One, two, three. So, if I'm in two mode, and I slide my edge loop, then I release... And you can immediately see it looks much nicer. The more that I slam one edge loop against another, or I should say the tighter the edge loop, the tighter the detail. So, if I want this to be really, really tight, I'll make the edge loops really close together. As close as I can. And then I'll hit Q for select, F8 for object mode click off the object. Let's go to three. Why are you not showing me three? Oh, there we go. I had the two button on. So I click three, and now you can see I have a pretty nice table. Top. It's got a slight bevel because of the three button. 
And back to what I said earlier, hit the one button to model and hit the three button to check. And then um, always make sure you have the three button on before rendering for every object. Because like nobody wants to hit the one button here and I think you'd agree with me, if you saw this in a video game, you would be like, what the crap, that's just really low poly for 2020. Unless it's a cell phone game. So let's talk a little bit about what the three button does uh, versus poly smoothing, because this actually does make a big difference. The three button shows you a preview, emphasis on preview, of what it would look like if it were poly smoothed. Great for Maya, great for rendering, but let's say I want to take this into the Unreal Engine, or take this into Unity, or take this into 3D Studio Max, or Soft Image, or Blender, or anywhere else. The three button isn't going to do you much good, so what do we do? We instead go to our poly modeling shelf, and we click on this guy. This is smoothing, or poly smoothing. It can be found under, I think, mesh smooth. Yeah, mesh smooth, it's the same thing. And look at that. Now, the actual topology has been changed, right? So that's the difference. The three button will not change the topology. The three button will give you a preview. I repeat, a preview of what the smooth will look like. I have a question. Like. Yes. What's your question? Um, how would you um, go about like selectively smoothing things, like if you Sure. Like, so... If you wanted to keep things um, a little bit um, flat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you could smooth just one part of it. Um, I don't recommend it, but I'll show you what happens. So, every single time you, you poly smooth something, each quad will be made into four quads. So, I'll prove my point by selecting the single face. If we select this... Oh, let's do two. Why not? So if we have two faces selected, and we poly smooth it, see, now I've got four. I'll repeat that again. Each time you select a quad and smooth it, I've got four. That's how smoothing works. So if I select the entire object and smooth it, then my poly count will jump up times four. So whatever this guy is, and by the way, we can go to display, heads up display, burp, 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 poly count. And so right now, Maya is saying, okay, you have, uh, mm, 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 like on this object, apparently 700. The way this works, by the way, is whatever object is selected is gonna be your second column. First column, all the polygons in the scene. Second column, selected. So when I select this, it says, oh, you've got 700 faces, and you've got 1,316, sorry, 1,360, rather, triangles, right? If I smooth this, boom, what do I have now? Now I have 5,520 triangles. So I repeat, every time that you smooth a polygon, you get four times the density. If I were to change my division to two here, that's going to do what? It's going to give me four times the density again. And now I have, oh my god, now I have like 22,080 triangles, which is, by the way, quite a lot for a candlestick. So, general rule of thumb, as a whole, for everything, always and forever, keep your poly count as low as possible. Because that helps, both because you don't want to model thousands and thousands and thousands of polygons unless you're sculpting them, say in ZBrush or, or Mudbox. You generally don't want to deal with this if you can help it. So what we'd like to do instead is we'd like to keep this down here to this very, very low poly model and just simply hit the three button and then render that. And that makes everybody happy because, you know, um, really our poly count is much lower. But if we want to send this somewhere to your game engine, to some other 3D package or whatever, um, if that's the case, then maybe you want to poly smooth it. Right, because this kind of looks kinda like crap. Uh, if I were to see this in a video game, I would be like, "What year is it? Is it 1984? Is the Star Fox? What's going on right now? I don't know." But this is probably not a very good model like this. So I would just poly smooth it. That looks a lot better, and then I would export that out to wherever you want. 
um, as an FBX or an OBJ file. Make sense? Maybe. Did that answer your question? Hopefully answered your question. I can't tell. You don't have to find reference for your table. Okay, good. I guess that was Zelda. Um, no, you don't have to find reference for your table. You probably should, but um, I'm going to allow you to, to freeform it. Okay. Let's keep going. I hope I don't regret my decision. <laughs> I don't know. Let's get back to the table. So here I have the three button on. Right? This is what it looks like with one. Let's poly smooth it. Like I just we just went over this, so click the poly smooth button. That automate automatically quadruples my density. So I can prove that to you here. by saying, look, it is 108 triangles right now. Again, if I poly smooth it, now I have 432 triangles, four times. I can even turn my division up again, and what do you think that's gonna, of course, it's gonna be four more times. So each time I poly smooth or add a division, it's times four in terms of the poly count. But we wanna keep this relatively low, so let's keep our divisions at, uh, Two, and even then, that's kind of a lot, but we're, we're gonna go with that for right now. And now, we're gonna continue with box modeling. Box modeling, of course, just means that we start from a box, but a very important thing that we do with box modeling is we can extrude a face. So, I'll shift select the faces, and by the way, face mode again is F11. Or if you're one of those right-click people, you can right-click and go to faces, whichever. It's up to you. So then I, I select the faces, and then I want to extrude. Um, this is the extrude button on the shelf, but hey, uh, I got a pro tip for you guys. I'm pretty sure that uh, if you hold down the shift button, and you just pull it down, oh my god, that's amazing. They stole that from Max, those bastards. Autodesk actually owned Max first, and then they bought Maya. And when they bought Maya, they just kind of stole a bunch of stuff from Max. And one of the things they stole from Max was holding down Shift to duplicate and extrude. It's pretty cool. Now I hit the three button. I got my legs. But you can see that, you know, this is looking maybe okay, but then up here it's like, whoa, this is uh, really weird and bendy and sort of uh, looks like a Fisher-Price table or a plastic table in kindergarten. Nah, I don't like it. So what do we do? We add edge loops, right? So then we can get to our edge loop tool up here, insert edge loop. But that's like mouse miles. I'm trying to avoid mouse miles. Like I already have carpal tunnel and it's like terrible. So what do I do to avoid mouse miles? I don't know. How can we avoid some mouse miles? Hmm. Well, anytime we have a component selected, like an edge or a face or a vertice, you can actually hold down shift, right click, and that'll bring up a lot of your poly modeling tools, a lot of them. And here you are right here, insert edge loop. And that saves me from having to constantly go up to my menus every time I need to do something. Oh my God, it's just kind of annoying to always have to go up here. So how do we avoid it? Well, um, the, I, yeah. I don't think we can actually see uh, when the tools pop up. So you don't, you can't see the menu when I do that. Like we can see the, um, we can see your mouse and we can see the Maya, like the main thing, but we can't see the tool wheel when it opens. Oh, so when you hold down Shift and right click, you don't see that. It's called a uh, hot box, I think, I believe, or a marking menu is sometimes what it's called. But if so, you can see this, right? You can see the drop down right now. The the drop down this menu, yes. You can see that? No, I don't, I don't think we can even see drop-down. What? That's, that's really weird. So you can't see, like when I go up to mesh or edit mesh or mesh. Yeah, me on the stream, it's not showing up. <sighs> yeah, I can't see the drop-down. That's ridiculous. I'm watching it right now because there's enough of a lag. 
So that, hold on. So none of these menus. It the, might be that you just have Maya selected. Oh yeah, it's weird. It like highlights it, but doesn't show you anything. Uh, what? Hmm. Wow. Um, I'm not sure what to do about this. This is an unforeseen like if issue. If you're streaming just the program, it might not be showing the windows. Well, in OBS, I'm using window capture. Maybe I can... Um, hmm. Is there another way... Hold on one second. I'm going to stop the stream for one second. Hold on.